True Crime Page Podcast featuring Scott Williams, Carlyons, 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 Carlyons. Welcome to the True Crime Page podcast. I'm your host, Scott Williams Collier. Today, we're going to cover the story of one of Britain's forgotten serial killers, Trevor Hardy, the Beast of Manchester. Now, Trevor Hardy was born on the 11th of June in 1945 in Newton Heath, Manchester. Uh, He grew up in a well-respected working-class family, Uh, There were no signs of any abuse or neglect as a child. Um, Now, it was clear, however, very early on in Trevor Hardy's life that he really was the black sheep of the family. Um, His bad behaviour started with bullying other children in the street and at school, and he was constantly in trouble. Um, The teachers were always writing letters for him to take home to his parents to... Uh, to tell them about his bad behaviour that day. And we can see very early on in Trevor Hardy's life that he really didn't have any respect for authority. Um, He didn't learn from his mistakes and he didn't respond to punishment. Now, Trevor Hardy's behaviour seemed to escalate the older he got. And it escalated even more after the birth of his younger brother, Now, Trevor Hardy's parents had another child later on in their life, Colin Hardy. And Colin Hardy has even said himself that he truly believes that um, Trevor Hardy was deeply resentful and jealous towards him. Uh, He resented the fact that he had a younger brother. Because up until then, uh, Trevor Hardy was the youngest of three children. And... As you get in some family dynamics, you know, the the, the youngest child, um, you get all the attention, your bad behaviour sometimes may get overlooked. And when Colin came along, um, I believe that that stole the limelight away from Trevor Hardy and that's something that he was deeply resentful about. I think it contributed towards his angry personality. Um, as Trevor Hardy got older, his crimes became more violent and uh, he was constantly in trouble. He was never out of trouble. He was very proud of the fact that he was a prolific house burglar. Um, He used to boast that he never took personal items when he broke into a house because they can be traced to him. Um, He would only look for cash. He spent most of his childhood his young life in Borstal's approved schools and and various institutions. In fact, um, his younger brother, Colin, has stated that when he was a young child, up until like eight, nine, ten years old, he has no recollection of his brother ever being at home because he was always locked up. Uh, Now, in a time period where people were a lot more trusting of one another, you know, we're talking the 1960s, 70s, you know, people were a lot more trusting and it was a time period where people would happily leave their back door and front door unlocked, people would leave their windows open. But if Trevor Hardy was ever in the area, if he was out of any institution that he'd been in and they knew he was out walking the streets, everybody would instantly lock their doors and lock their windows because nobody trusted him. Um, Trevor Hardy's uh, criminal behaviour was really really um it ashamed the hardy family um because none of them were like that uh trevor hardy's father was a very straight laced guy he never got in trouble with the police his mother was a hard working lady she loved the children 
She worked. She brought money into the family home. The children were all looked after. Uh, so Trevor Hardy's behaviour was deeply embarrassing to them. Um, Colin Hardy uh, even said that as a child, his brother's behaviour completely overshadowed his life. He was never invited to childhood parties. If his friends had any birthday parties, they would never invite him. And it was, it was basically because of his older brother's criminal reputation. Um, now, as I said, Trevor Hardy spent most of his childhood in institutions, but he was also constantly escaping. He became so much of a problem to the authorities. Um, in order to detain him and stop him from escaping, they held him at one point when he was 15 years old in an adult prison in Manchester, the notorious Strange Ways prison, which made him the youngest person ever to be held at that prison. Now, uh, Trevor Hardy's uh, behaviour showed no signs of stopping. Uh, in fact, he became more increasingly violent and volatile with age. Uh, he was a ticking time bomb, basically. He started to walk around with a knife. He was constantly getting into fist fights with people. Um, he was well known around all the pubs around Manchester. Um, in fact, his brother Colin said he was the type of person he could walk into a pub in Manchester and he would empty the place within minutes because people knew if they stayed in the pub, there would be at some point some trouble in the, in, in, on the premises because his brother was that volatile. When he drank, he became very nasty and he constantly got into fights with people. Uh, as a teenager, Hardy committed numerous violent crimes. Um, at one point, he shot a teenager in the head with an air rifle. In another unprovoked attack, he approached a man, headbutting him in the face and then stabbing him in the leg, narrowly missing an artery. In 1972, uh, Trevor Hardy committed another violent crime. Um, this time, it was over a round of drinks. He got into an argument with a gentleman um, over who should be paying for the next round of drinks. He left the premises and he returned back to the pub with a pickaxe and proceeded to knock the other guy senseless and caused um, serious injuries to him. The injuries were so serious, in fact, that years later he did die, um, and he died as a, of a result of the injuries that were inflicted on, on him that day. Um, Trevor Hardy was sent down for five years for that attack. Now, during his time, he served um, his prison sentence at the Isles of Wight um, Albany Prison, um, he served a few years there and he, he eventually walked free on the 18th of November in 1974. Now, when he left prison, he already had murder in mind because while he was locked up, he had an infatuation with a young schoolgirl called Beverly. Now, Beverly had apparently written to Trevor while he was in prison, serving his sentence, and told him that she'd found a boyfriend her own age. Um, and obviously this infuriated Trevor Hardy. And when he came out of prison, uh, within a matter of weeks, he would commit his first murder. His first murder victim was 15-year-old Janet Leslie Stewart. Now, Janet was dropped off in Newton Heath uh, one evening. Uh, on her way to meet her boyfriend to go to a works party. Unfortunately for the young girl, uh, she had the misfortune of um, bumping into a very angry and vengeful Hardy. Um, now, Hardy, after he was arrested, stated that he'd mistook her for the schoolgirl that he'd gone to attack, uh, named Beverly. Um, he stabbed her in the throat um, on New Year's Eve, uh, killing the girl. He then dragged her to a nearby clay pit where he buried her in a shallow grave. Now, this next bit is quite macabre. Now, we know that from history, when we look at serial killers, um, 
Many of them like to return to the scene of the crime. And they do this to relive the crime. And they're obviously doing it because they want to get some kind of stimulation, sexual gratification, and, and be able to remember the crime that they commit. They, they've committed. Now, Trevor Hardy, over the next few months, constantly returned back to the body of Janet Leslie Stewart. And he returned back to the body to, dis, uh, to dismember it and to spread her remains all over the place. He cut her head off and threw it in a nearby lake. He then returned on another occasion and cut off her hands and buried them in another location close to the body. He returned again to cut off her feet. Uh, he returned again at another, uh, another point of time to remove a ring that was um, on her hand. And he gave that ring to um, a new love interest uh, named Sheila Farrow an older woman who he'd started a relationship with. Now, this is something that Trevor Hardy seems to do in all his crimes, and we'll see this in the other crimes that we discuss in a moment. Um, this need to keep constantly returning back to the scene of the crime. Now, in one instance, he's apparently trying to destroy evidence, and in a, in a sense, he is. But, He's also taking a massive risk by continually keep going back to the body. He's risking someone seeing him, someone going over to the location where he is to investigate, and he's risking that being reported back to the police and being caught. So it seems to me that interacting with the body, going back to the crime of the scene, destroying the body, um, this is obviously something that is far more important to him than um, than not drawing attention to himself. And as we know with all serial killers, you know, a lot of the time they think they're a lot cleverer than law enforcement, they're a lot cleverer than the general public, they can't get caught, they like to take risks, uh, and they like to relive their crimes. Um, and that kind of behaviour... Um, continually going back to the body to dismember it is very serial killer-esque kind of behaviour. Now, seven months later, on the 17th of July, 1975, Hardy attacked 17-year-old Wanda Scully as she walked home from work in the evening. Um, now, she was brutally bludgeoned with a paving stone and she was beaten so badly that her face was it looked mutilated she was left unrecognizable um, he then strangled the poor girl with with her stockings um, and then he bit her on the body and he stripped her body and bit one of her nipples off now this this is clearly a sexually multi motivated attack he's getting sexual gratification from inflicting this pain and killing the girl um, the next day uh, Wanda was uh, discovered by a passerby. She'd been partially buried by bricks and cardboard. And uh, when, when the police came to the scene of the crime, they found a scene of, of utter carnage. Um, she was unrecognisable. Her eyes had been removed. She'd had a nipple bitten off. Um, the police thought that the eyes had been taken as some kind of souvenir, but... They, they realised shortly after that her eyeballs had been inserted inside her torso. So, you know, why would someone do something like that? This clearly shows somebody who is absolutely revelling in the brutality and the violence that they're inflicting on this young girl. Um, he was obviously um, enjoying the act of killing someone. So much so that he actually took mementos from the crime scene. Um, he took with him some of Wanda's uh, bloody clothes. He took a handbag and he took a pair of her shoes. Now, strangely, a couple of days after the police had finished at the crime scene, Hardy decided to return back to the scene of the crime and he left the bloody shoes at the location where Wanda Scully's body 
was found. Now, this is clearly an attempt to taunt the police and the, the general public. Um, but also, again, it shows that Trevor Hardy just cannot stop returning to the scene of the crime. Um, he's obviously getting stimulation and gratification from constantly returning to the scene of the crime. You know, uh, taking a risk by returning back there, taunting the police by leaving evidence there and leaving clues. Um, it's obviously something that's very gratifying and stimulating to him. Now, seven days after the Wanda Scholar murder, uh, murder uh, Trevor Hardy and his um, girlfriend, uh, Sheila Farrow, went to visit their parents. And this is where he bumped into his younger brother, Colin. Now, Colin had not seen his brother for months. And if he'd have known that his older brother was there, he wouldn't have visited his parents that day. But unfortunately... He found himself face to face with his brother and Trevor Hardy was insisting that Colin come for a drink with him and his girlfriend Sheila that evening. Obviously Colin didn't want to go but in his own words Colin uh, Hardy said that Trevor Hardy was not somebody he walked out on. So he was in a predicament where he had to appease his brother and go along for a drink with him that evening. So they went for a drink at the Albion pub in Middleton and it was during that evening after they'd had a few drinks that uh, Trevor Hardy started to talk about the Wanda Scully, uh, Scully murder. Um, and, you know, this intrigued Colin. And Colin questioned him and said, why are you so interested in this murder? As uh, plain as anything, Trevor Hardy just turned around and said, it was me. Um, now, obviously, Colin was terrified at this point and he really wanted to get away from his brother. Um, but he just felt like he, he couldn't walk away from him. Um, he felt obliged that he had to stick with his brother, or else something terrible would happen if he tried to walk away from him. Uh, reluctantly, he took Trevor and his girlfriend, uh, Sheila Farrow, back to his house. And it was there that Trevor viciously attacked his younger brother um, and left him unconscious at the bottom of the stairs. He then, after beating his brother senseless went up to his wife uh, and demanded that she make him some beans on toast because he was hungry and she was so terrified of him that she just obliged and made him something to eat now the day after Colin uh, Hardy went to the police and he spent 16 hours being interrogated by the police and he told them that his brother was responsible for the murder of Wanda Scala um, after uh, questioning him for so long, they eventually went and arrested Trevor Hardy. Um, but Trevor Hardy was not going to stay in prison for this crime. He was determined to get away with this crime. He'd already concocted an alibi with his girlfriend, Sheila Farrow. He manipulated uh, her into giving the police a false alibi to tell the police that Trevor Hardy was actually with her at the night of the murder of Wanda Scala, which was obviously untrue. Um, also, more interestingly, um, she smuggled a small file into the, um, the prison cell where Trevor Hardy was when she went to visit him. And in an attempt to um, stop his teeth marks from being identified as those that could have possibly bitten Wanda Scala's bo body, um, he filed his own teeth down. Um, and he, he would have had to have filed them down to an extent where they were almost not far away from the, just above the gum line. Um, and it would have been exposing um, nerves that are in the teeth. Now, just thinking about that makes me wince. You feel all the vibration that's going through your jaw and into your head and you're exposing, um, you're exposing nerves that are in your teeth. This is how far Trevor Hardy is willing to go to not get caught, to not spend time in prison. Um, and that is just crazy. Filing your own teeth down. He filed all his teeth down in his mouth so that his, his, his bike mark uh, would not be matched to those found on the body of Wanda Scully. Now, unfortunately, because of the alibi the false alibi that his girlfriend Sheila Farrow gave him, 
and the fact that he'd filed down his own teeth. The police believed that he wasn't responsible for the crime and they let him go. Um, Much to Colin uh, Hardy's horror, they said that they didn't believe him and they've had to let him go. Uh, And Colin Hardy uh, said to the police, if he kills me or kills another person, let it be on your head. Now, in the coming months, under the circumstances, you would expect someone uh, in Trevor Hardy's predicament to keep a low profile. He's just recently been questioned about a brutal murder of a young girl. Um, He killed another uh, young girl um, a year or so before her. Um, You would expect him to keep a low profile, but that seems to be something that Trevor Hardy can't do. Um, During those months, uh, after being released from the police, um, police custody, um, he was hailed a hero after rescuing a couple from a burning house. Uh, now that was of, of course, until later on, he actually admitted that he was the person that set the fire. So very strange behaviour. Um, to me, it shows a little bit of narcissism there that he he needs to. He needs to draw attention to him. He needs to be uh, creating situations where he's getting attention. Um, very odd behaviour from from somebody who um, has recently just brutally murdered a young girl. Um, not not keeping a low profile. Instead, doing the complete opposite and drawing attention to himself. Now, not much longer after that, um, in March 1976... Hardy would claim his third and final victim. Sharon Mosforth, uh, a 17-year-old, was returning home from work. Uh, She'd been to a works party that evening when she crossed paths with Trevor Hardy. Um, Now, at the time, according to Hardy, he was trying to uh, break into a store, um, which was Sharon Mosforth's place of work. Unfortunately, she made the fateful uh, decision of challenging him Um, Hardy brutally attacked the young girl he beat her around the head Um, he strangled her and then he bit her on the body like he did with Wanda Scully he bit one of her nipples off he bit her on the body leaving his teeth marks on there and then he threw her in the Rochdale Canal now later yet again he returns back to the body um, this time armed with a screwdriver He jumped into the cold, uh, icy water of the Rochdale Canal and proceeded to mutilate and stab her around the parts where he'd bit her. Um, Now, there there really is no need for him to do this. Again, we see that in one instance he's trying to destroy evidence, um, but he's also taking a massive risk because he's interacting with the body and going back to the crime scene and being risked uh, risking uh, being seen by a witness so th- this is clearly um, behavior that he's doing because he's getting sexual gratification from destroying the body interacting with the body returning to the crime in the scene and there really is no need for him to keep doing that now the day after um Sharon Mossworth's body was found frozen in the Rochdale Canal Um, and it soon became very apparent to the police in Manchester that they had a potential serial killer on the loose. Now because Trevor Hardy had already been questioned about the Wanda Scala murder he was obviously a person of interest and somebody they wanted to speak to. He was a suspect. Uh, During this time Um, Trevor Hardy had also attacked a woman in a nightclub and nearly killed her. Um, He was strangling her in a toilet and the only thing that saved this woman was the fact that he was disturbed by someone and he fled the scene. Um, He spent the coming months um, trying to evade the police um, at different locations um, but thankfully he was eventually caught uh, in August of 1976 at a house in Stockport. Um, during questioning, he admitted to the murder of the two girls um, and then he also admitted to the murder 
of Leslie Ann Stewart, who was um, still marked down as a missing person. Uh, he showed no remorse to the police when he took them to the location where he dumped her body. Um, now, this is something that we've seen before from serial killers. Probably the most famous of all was Ted Bundy. Uh, Trevor Hardy sacked his QC uh, and represented himself in court. And he tried to get a lesser charge of manslaughter. Um, obviously, that was rejected by the judge. And the judge senten sentenced him to free uh, life sentences. And thankfully, he would spend the rest of his life in prison. Uh, he eventually died of a heart attack um, in his cell in September 2000, on the 25th of September in 2012, after spending 35 years in prison. And uh, that marked the, the end uh, of the reign of terror that Trevor Hardy um, had on the Manchester area. Uh, no doubt in my mind that if he hadn't bragged to his brother Colin that evening, he'd have definitely gone on to kill other people. He was getting great gratification um, from the murders that he was committing, um, a sadistic uh, pleasure from killing those young girls, and he would have definitely continued um, in his criminal behaviour murdering young girls so it was it was uh, a blessing in disguise really that he had that fateful meeting with his brother that day and decided to tell his brother that he'd uh, killed Wanda Scala no doubt in my mind that he did that in order to intimidate his brother probably also to brag as well um, but thankfully that was his undoing and he was eventually caught um what I find unusual about Trevor Hardy is that the crimes he committed were really brutal. Probably the, some of the most brutal crimes we've ever had in this country. He's right up there with the worst of the worst, like Peter Sutcliffe, the Moores murderers, Dennis Nielsen, Fred West. Um, he's up there with people like that. But not many people know about him. Uh, he seems to have... Um, people seem to have forgotten about him. My girlfriend Amanda Wood wrote um, a really good blog on Trevor Hardy a few months ago and uh, I even had people from Manchester commenting on that and saying uh, I, I didn't even know about this guy and I'm from Manchester. Uh, but there you go, that's the story of Trevor Hardy. He was one of the most brutal, vicious serial killers we've ever had in the UK. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please like subscribe and share the channel uh, just to give you a feel of what's coming next i'm going to do a feature length show on the east lanks ripper case i i had chris clark on a few months ago to discuss the east lanks ripper case and we discussed his theory on who potentially the killer could be i've also written a couple of blogs recently on the east lanks ripper case the reason i'm so interested in that case is because a couple of those crimes happened very close to my hometown of Lee. One of them was inside Lee. Uh, the body was dumped at Pennington Flash. Um, that was the body of Maria Aquina. Um, and also a few years before that, the brutal murder of Linda Donaldson, who was dumped just outside Lee on Winnick Lane in the farmer's field in Lowton. Uh, there was also another crime, um, the murder of Julie Finlay, that took place in 1994 in St. Helens, not far from the East Lancashire Road. Um, I believe that those three crimes are connected and they were committed by the same person. So I'm going to do a feature show on that. Um, that's going to be in the next one coming up soon. I've got a lot of other interesting shows that I'm going to do. I'm going to have Chris Clark back on to discuss the Stephen Downing story. Um, if you don't know who Stephen Downing is, he suffered the worst case of uh, miscarriage of justice in the UK. He spent over 27 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Uh, Chris Clark uh, ghost wrote uh, Stephen's book so we're going to have Chris on to discuss that and um, I'm also going to do a show on the unsolved case of Lisa Hessian so stay tuned for those um, right that's it for today I uh, hope you enjoyed the show please as always like share and subscribe to the channel I really do appreciate it uh, until next time guys 
Have a great week ahead. Look after each other. Be good. And I'll see you soon.